All right. It is my pleasure now to be joined by Atlanta Falcons salary cap and contracts analyst, Emily Batis. Emily, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I, I mean, I finally now have someone that has subjected themselves to uh, me being able to ask a couple questions about a world that I would just love to know more about. And that is the inside <laughs> operations of an NFL franchise. <laughs> so really, thank you. I, um, of course, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so uh, obviously, if your title is you know, salary cap and contracts analyst, could, could we just start with we're right now, it is mid-season. The Falcons are coming off of a bye. What does your life look like now um, while you are in season? Um, so in season, I don't do as much cap and contract stuff. You know, we're not typically working on negotiations or anything. I mean, some will come up, but more of the guys we sign are minimums anyways. Um, so in season, I actually help our other analysts a fair amount with some coaching reports um, and game prep every week. Um, and then there are some, some maintenance salary cap reports I'll run uh, every couple of weeks or every month or so just to get more of a view of the league and um, what their salary caps are looking like. But now that we're you know, closing in on almost December, um, I'll start changing my focus to maybe more of the free agency side pretty soon here. And before you do that, though, um, what, what exactly does your team look like? How many people are you working with? Um, our analytics department is three people. So our manager of football analytics is John, and then there's myself. Um, and then our other analyst, his title is football analyst, and that's Danny Luskin. So we're a team of three, and then we're actually within the football technology department. Got it. So then there's our app developers and our video department as well. Awesome. So when you're around trade deadline, all of a sudden, are you running ad hoc analysis on like, if this person were to come <laughs> over, like, can we make it work? Does that type of stuff ever happen? Um, not that specific. Um, I'll look at, you know, some activity that's taken place historically, um, especially around the trade deadline. But um, as far as cap space goes and things like that, I haven't gotten to dig that deep into it. But this year was for most teams, honestly, pretty quiet. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, COVID just certainly threw a, a wrench into pretty much every company ever's plans for how they were going to go about their business. Yeah, it's definitely been a huge change. I mean, I've been working from home um, since mid-March. So oh, wow. yeah, I'm, you know, I can do my job from home. I don't need to be in the building like a lot of other people in football operations. So um, I've actually been based out of outside Philadelphia for most of all of the season and then most of the off season since COVID started, except for training camp. But, you know, it's it's been weird because football is in a typical work from home job. So it's been a big adjustment for a lot of people. I can imagine. Uh, and, but good for you guys for being able to pull it off. I, I mean, I think it just goes to show, uh, again, not just your world, but the entire business world, how much can actually be done if you embrace technology, you know, the um, rigid borders of having to show up uh, every day, uh, suddenly we're erased for a lot of places. Yeah, I think it's going to be awesome for companies and sports too, just, you know, showing people that we can get our jobs done and work from home and pull it off. You know, we pulled off a virtual draft literally a month into working from home. And that was difficult and very, uh, have some long hours, but it was really cool to see how it worked. And the viewership was at an all time high. I'm pretty sure for the draft this year. So I'm glad that, um, people got to witness the hard work that went into all the clubs pulling it off the way that they did. Yeah. I mean, people witnessed history and when they announced that that was going to happen, I certainly was among the crowd that was like, Oh, something's going to go wrong for, for <laughs> some team. There's too many players involved, but and by players, I mean, teams and the individuals on those teams um, that something's going to go wrong. And then nothing did. I, I was amazed at how well it went off. 
Yeah, it was it was pretty impressive, honestly, for all of those teams and all the people involved at every club to pull it off as well as we did. And then, you know, the league office on top of that to be as involved as they were too. It just, it was very seamless. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, we proved that it can work that way because, you know, at this rate, it might have to happen again this year, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, but before I ask about what happens in the off season, um, you, you know, you, this is your fourth season with the team. Um, so you, it, this obviously is not then your first rodeo. Do you feel at all like in season, if the team's doing well or they're doing poorly, whether it's a win streak or a losing streak, does it feel different for you just being in the building? Like does team performance actually affect the stress in, in your day to day? Um, so I will say that, I mean, there's definitely a different high and a low to, to winning and losing. Um, and I think fans don't really realize, you know, they fans get so upset when their team loses and they're pissed off for the rest of the day, but they go to their job the next day and it's like, Oh, you know, nothing happened yesterday. It doesn't affect their life. But um, when you work in it, it's, it definitely, I mean, has some pressure to it. And um on a Monday after a loss, you act maybe a little uh, more to yourself and um, just keep your head down in the hallway. But uh, the day after a win is awesome because everyone's fired up and ready to go for the next week. So there's definitely um, some, uh, you would rather win, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so in essence though, you, you guys are really, it, essentially it, it doesn't matter the department um, being part of the franchise means that you are, you're writing whatever high the, the, the team's on and that high could be relatively low or it could be very high. I, I was just curious how much the ripple effect was to the other auxiliary departments outside of football, the, the players and coaches themselves. So with like our departments in football operations, so we have the, you know, direct interaction with the coaches and with the GM and um, everyone else that's involved in football ops. So um, I can't necessarily speak to our, our uh, organization is different where we have our front office and then we have the rest of our company that works at, you know, out of the stadium and um, some other locations. And I'm not sure uh, the feeling that they get, you know, being removed from the same building as us, but I would imagine that they probably still hurt at least somewhat of, and feel what we feel a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, all, all right. So when free agency comes and the season is over, can you just talk about how you think about approaching that part of the season in terms of like, okay, do you think first about the players that have expiring contracts or, or are you more geared towards potential uh, people to come and play for the Falcons? I, I mean, do you have a sort of, priority of sorts that you think through what the next few months will look like? So typically um, in season, I have an idea of who we're going to extend um, that's currently on our team. And I'll, you know, leisurely work through um, my analysis and what I'm going to recommend and um, be prepared for when that comes up. So we don't typically know who we're going to go after in free agency more till the season has ended and we have those discussions. So I definitely focus more on um, our players first and foremost. And then once I have a idea of um, who we're targeting in free agency, then I can really uh, get nitty gritty down into that and work on that stuff pretty much up until the beginning of free agency. Got it. Now, I, I really want to talk about what you did in school, which will provide a little bit more clarity about how you go about your work today. But I, I have to ask, I say that because I am sure that you are completely professional. Everything is by the numbers, but do you ever have that little fan in you that says like, oh man, I liked this guy on the field. Like you have to get a little bit of a bias out of your own head when it comes to looking at your own work and being as objective as you possibly can be. Yeah. Um, there's obviously players that I really like, like I love Mohamed Sanu, um, and you know, we traded him last season and then the Patriots dropped him this year. And there is part of me that was like, oh, let's bring him back. You know, it would be 
awesome. He's such a good guy and such a good locker room guy. Um, but at the end of the day, it's probably not the move that we should make. And so I kind of just keep that to myself that that's something that I would like to do because <laughs> right now it's not my, my time to make that decision. So. <laughs> right. Well, um, now, of course, for us to have this conversation, I really want to provide the context for how you got here, because that to me um, it is just, again, there's only 32 teams. If you're on a team of three people, that's less than 100 jobs in the world that, that are like what you have. So um, can we take this back to like when you're an undergrad, do, do, you, um, do you mind talking about what you studied and at the time where you thought your road might take you? Yeah, so uh, truthfully, like I did not always plan on this being my career path. I didn't go into school knowing that this is where I wanted to end up. Um, I actually went into undergrad as a political science major and was planning to go to law school after. And, you know, at one point maybe wanted to be a federal judge. Like, I don't know, my head was in a completely different space. And um, I got really bored with political science. And then I switched to math, which, you know, probably sounds equally as boring as political science to a lot of people, but um, I always excelled in math and really enjoyed it. So uh, towards the end of college, I actually took the first actuarial exam, um, thinking maybe that would be my next step. And i um, very glad I decided to go to grad school and I got my master's in applied statistics. And uh, that's really when sports analytics came to mind and became my career goal. And working specifically on cap and contracts wasn't in my mind at all until um, my initial internship was extended and I was actually doing it. It was nothing I had thought about before. And now I love it so much. And one of my new career goals is to eventually be negotiating the contracts myself. That's awesome that um, a you, 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 you kind of, in, in essence, rolled with the punches. You sort of you, you were flexible in your approach where you were sort of able to see what was available and how that could then lead to next steps. And, you know, for your internship to be extended and obviously then you're still again now on your fourth year with, with the Falcons. I, I mean, it seems like they've shown the capability to be flexible as well. And, you know, when they see talent, you know, think through, okay, what can we do to keep this person here? I, I mean, it, I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth or theirs, but, but does that seem to be accurate? Yeah, um, after my, my first six months of my internship, that was all I was supposed to be in Atlanta for. You know, I had a six month lease. I was leaving at the end of February. Like I was sleeping with the mattress on the floor. Didn't take any furniture with me because thought it was temporary. Um, and then the director of football operations wanted an intern. And so that became my new position. And then I became the salary cap research and analytics assistant and for seven more months. And then it was made full time. And um, yeah, they, they made the position for me, which was awesome. So um, that's all you got to do really is work hard. <laughs> um, it, I have to ask though, how do you get that initial internship? Uh, Cause I mean, that has to be a very highly sought after internship. So I actually, while I was still in my last semester of grad school, I had applied to a full-time position with the Texans, um, interviewed briefly, didn't get it. But then um, Carl, who's, who ended up hiring me with the Falcons is good buddies with the guy at Houston and said, you know, we're about to look for an intern. Was there anyone that you looked at for your position that you really liked? And my resume was the one that was passed along. And then they reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested. So um, then I went through the interview process and had to take some coding tests to show that I knew I was capable of the job. And ended up being the one that got it. So just luck of the draw, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, a big believer that you sort of create your own luck. So it, maybe it was luck of the draw, but you're only in there because of everything you did for the years leading up to it. Um, it it's just, it's still crazy to me to like that someone finds a way to like, it, to, if I've always thought of it as just this highly sought after uh, job and intern um, so do, do you have any advice to anyone that would be, you know, in undergrad now that's looking to possibly break in? Yeah. So one of the things that really helped me is especially, I can't speak to every internship opportunity within football or football operations. Um, but for analytics, at least our 
the length of time for the internship was mid August to mid February and it's full time, um, more than 40 hours a week. So if you're in school, that's, you can't really do that. You know, you either have to take time off or already be finished school. And I think that's something that people may not realize, like trying to get internships, they look for summer internships and, um, we're actually off mid June to mid July. The majority of the time colleges are not in school. So, um, summer internships aren't really possible. So I think though for someone that would be able to get an internship or a position, um, my best piece of advice is just like be willing to start from the bottom and work really difficult. And, you know, like I said, I was an intern for over a year. So you have to grind and show the people above you how dedicated you really are. And I think too, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, working in sports would be amazing. It's my dream. But I, I think it takes a special breed of person to not just want to work in sports, but to make it in sports. You know, like you have to be willing to miss parties and dinners with friends and even some holidays spent with your family. You know, we there are games on Christmas and Thanksgiving and um, my family is from outside Philly and I live in Atlanta. So it's not always easy, but in the end, it's really all worth it because the passion you have for your job and Hopefully at the end of the day, being able to put on a Super Bowl ring and see all your hard work staring back at you in the face. Um, but I also think putting yourself out there um, and trying to make connections with people that are already in the industry is really important, but at the same time, being cognizant of the time of year it is. So I think a lot of students and um, people don't think about, you know, in season or free agency or during the draft, like that's a really crazy time for most of the people in football ops. And it's going to be really difficult for people to get back to you and respond and make the time to set up a call. So, you know, just paying attention to the time of year it is. And then still like, aside from that, definitely reach out to the people that are in similar, a similar position to the one you want to be in. And it's the great place to start. Awesome. Awesome advice. Um, now you, you were on the, the measurables podcast where you went into what I'm about to ask in greater detail. So I will push everyone to go check that out if they want more on the nitty gritty of the actual programming knowledge that you had to have in your back pocket as you went down this road. So do you mind talking about what you uh, had learned throughout your academic career and then what maybe you had to learn when you wanted to make the jump over to working in the NFL? Yep. Um, so in undergrad, I learned R and MATLAB. Um, haven't really used MATLAB since then, but R definitely was a great first tool to, to use. And then in grad school, um, it was all SAS based with some R elective courses. So I took some more of those. Um, but then to working for the Falcons, the coding test that I had to take was in SQL. Um, had never used SQL, maybe said that I had, um, and learned it on the fly for the for the test and did well enough, I guess, that um, you know, I got the position. But it's once you know one, it's like it's very easy to pick up another one because they are very similar. But um, those are the ones that, you know, I spent the most time in. And then now um I use some C sharp uh within like Visual Studio and this reporting tool that we use but I mostly live in SQL these days with a little R mixed in. There you go. Yeah. And I had heard on, on that other podcast that you guys communicate on an app to one another. Like when you have a report that that's how you can share it to uh, colleagues on the team. Yep. Yeah. Um, we have an internal app. Pretty much every team has an internal app now. Um, and that's, we can publish reports up, which is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's certainly better than an email. Uh, that that yeah. much I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, you know, I actually, um, one thing I'd skipped over, uh, something that I've seen a lot of, and maybe I'm sure it's been going on for a lot longer, is the, the idea of like front loading and back loading contracts, um, because every athlete seemingly cares about the average annual value. Have you, is that a trend? Like, am I super late to the party? Has this been going on for a while that these front loaded or back loaded contracts? Um, I actually don't work too much with the, the structuring of contracts, but I've started. Oh, that's a couple of years from now when, when you're really deep in the negotiation. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping, but, um, I think you can, 
you tend to notice the teams with less cap room uh, backload and teams with more cap room that are able to will front load uh, just so it's a lot easier to get out of the contract if you need to. But <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's I can't speak much more to that right now. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I did just also want to follow up on one other thing I had heard you speak on, which is when it comes to offensive linemen and trying to figure out how to best work on structuring a, a deal when there's not hard numbers on something. Um, it made me think of pro football focus, you know, has outside analytics, you know, companies ha have those impacted how you do your work? Cause now there's a widely accepted grade on, on players that uh, players really take to heart. Like, like they're rating on Madden. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't necessarily work off their PFF grades. Um, we get them, but that's, it's not as recognized by us as the fair grade because, you know, we do internal grading, um, sure. but agents will reference them sometimes. Um, but it's definitely been nice. We get more, we get more analytics and stats than um, we would just get from the league, which has been really cool getting stuff from PFF and we've been able to integrate their their stats more and more into what we do every day. So there's been a lot more buy-in um, now on PFF stats, which has been cool. So at first, you know, it's like, well, no, we only trust the NFL, um, what they're giving us, but now there's a lot of use for PFF stats too. So that's been really awesome. That helps a lot. Got it. Well, you know, the, the Marlins, I believe just hired the first ever female GM. So <laughs> I know that contract negotiating will probably be in your future, but am I speaking to a future NFL GM? Is, do you think that that is the ultimate goal so far? That is my ultimate goal. Um, I would love to be the first female GM in the NFL, although given my age, I'm, I'm pretty sure someone's probably going to beat me to it, which will be amazing regardless. Um, but that is my goal. Um, and with her getting that position, you know, it, that was a week ago, like, before that, my, my goal, like, obviously I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it someday. That's, it's who I am. I'm going to do it. But, um, having it actually happen in a men's professional sport, it, it makes it so much more of a reality now. And it's so inspirational and really cool to see. Yeah. And I'd say that's, uh, Dr. Jen Walter being a coach in the NFL, once you, once you see that, and now there's like, you can point to that person and say, well, she did it. So now we know what can be done. I mean, the, the glass barrier, uh, being shattered is always, you know, a moment that can never be taken away and, and only allows for more progress to be made. Yeah. I think the NFL is steps behind that now, you know, seeing it happen, they have to act and someone, some, NFL team's got to be the first one to do it. And I hope it's me, but if someone beats me to, to it, it's still going to be me someday. So, well, I'm just happy. I had a chance to talk to you back in 2020 when you were just working at, <laughs> on your first fourth year with the team. Uh, so we'll, we'll mark it down and we'll have to, uh, when you get that role, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and have to uh, talk about what you had to do to get there. Thank you. My, uh, my, Second boss for um, my second, my boss for my second internship. Um, I said it once and he wrote it down on his whiteboard with the date. Um, I've been saying it for, for a few years now. So hopefully it, not hopefully, it's going to come to fruition. It's just a matter of one. It starts as a thought, then you, you speak it, then you act on it. I, I mean, there's only one direction it can go in given the course that you apparently have been on for quite some time. Yeah. <laughs> well, We'll see. Hopefully it's, it's not too long from now. <laughs> well, Emily, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Um, it, it's been great to learn a little bit more about your world and how you got there. And uh, I guess I'll end by saying go Falcons. I, I hope that, uh, that the rest of the season goes well and uh, you hit free agency uh, ready to rock and roll. Thank you. Yeah, we have the Saints this weekend, you know, so. Big no game. Drew Brees though. What? No Drew Brees, so. It, no Drew Brees, yeah. And we, we play him again two weeks after, so we might miss him twice this season. If you're going to play the Saints, that's the way to go. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Big rivalry game, so the atmosphere is always rolling, and it's a fun, fun matchup. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you.